So please welcome Joe Lockhart. My, my story uh, is, starts in uh, late July um, in Washington, D.C. It was a typical hot summer day. I found myself in the Oval Office by myself, and in walked the President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. And he said to me, I hear you want to be my next, my next press secretary. And I said, yes, sir, I think I do. And it happened. Now, there should have been some warning signs for me. Some of the obvious, like you know, the Lewinsky investigation, a couple that were not so obvious. One was, the guy who I was replacing, Mike McCurry, as soon as I heard I'd taken the job, he started smiling. And for six weeks, the smile didn't come off his face. <laughs> the second one, which was weird, was I was the only applicant for the job. <laughs> there was no interview process. Nobody else applied. I was the only one in America who seemed to want the job. But I have this thing about challenging myself personally, like standing here right now, and I thought, you know, I can do this, so I'm going to try to do it. Uh, I didn't have to wait long for the challenge. My very first day, walking out to the podium in the White House press room, simultaneously to the moment, the House Judiciary Committee were gaveling in the third impeachment hearings in the history of the country. So, you know, I had a few things on my mind. <laughs> and I would love to say that I got off to a good start, but I can't. Um, just after I started, we went on a trip. We went off to Russia. We were going to Ireland doing big foreign policy stuff. Trip was going pretty well. <clears throat> the last night in Moscow, I was coming into the hotel, and I ran into a friend of mine, an old friend of mine, the godfather to my daughter, hadn't seen in a couple years. And he said, come on, we've got to go out. We've got to go out. And he convinced me, you know, we were going to go see the, the real Moscow. And we went to, I'll never forget, a place called the Hungry Duck. And they were doing things there that I couldn't take my eyes off, so I had to stay until 5 in the morning which was okay because we weren't leaving till six. So I got back to my hotel and made one mistake, which was to sit down on the bed. And obviously, I fell asleep. And I'm telling you, you don't know anxiety, crack, uh, after a crack attack or not, <laughs> until you've woken up as the White House press secretary on your first foreign trip at 6.15 in Moscow without a passport, knowing you've missed Air Force One. <laughs> now, the only good thing that I could think of the only good thing I could think of was the day couldn't get worse. I was wrong. When I finally caught up with the traveling party, I was immediately surrounded by reporters who said, how do you feel about being the first White House press secretary to ever miss Air Force One on a foreign trip? And a strange phrase just caught in my head, and I couldn't lose it. About a week earlier, the president had been at a prayer breakfast talking about his affair with Monica Lewinsky. And he said, you know, I'm really sorry for what I did, and I'm working very hard uh, to make up for it, particularly to those I've hurt the most. So when I got the question of how do you feel, I said, I'm really sorry for what I've done wrong, <laughs> and I'm working hard to fix it, particularly those who I've hurt the most. <laughs> now, mocking the President of the United States when you make a mistake <laughs> isn't always the best idea, but it's, it came in my head and I said it. So anyway, the day went on, and we finally had a little break where the president had some private meetings, and I went to the back of the Irish ambassador's uh, residence to go to sleep. And I hadn't been asleep for more than five minutes, and I was actually pretty hungover, why, which is why I needed the sleep. And the president's personal aide came back and said, the president's in a meeting right now, and he, needs, he wants you to come into it. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but this had practical joke written all over it. And I said, get lost. About three minutes later, he came in and said, Hey, the president's in. He's, he's, he's in with the band U2, with Bono, and they want to talk to you. <clears throat> I said, well, if the president wants to see me, he can walk his presidential ass right back to this room and ask me himself. <laughs> well, about 60 seconds later, the presidential ass showed up <laughs> and said, what is your problem? These guys want to meet you. <laughs> so I, I walked into the meeting. And this guy, this rock star, Bono, comes up and gives me this big hug and says, I really want to meet you. And I said, well, that's great, Mr. Bono, but um, <laughs> why? And he said, anyone who can handle world affairs, you know, Monica Lewinsky and all that, and still has time to stay out all night drinking is my kind of guy. <laughs> <clears throat> now, most people, most people would think, you know, Bono, you too, telling you that they like your work, that'd be great. 
One problem. I'd spent most of the day making sure the president didn't know I'd missed Air Force One, and Bono busted me. <laughs> <clears throat> but after that inauspicious start, things started going pretty well. We, we reached a historic budget deal, and I got to talk about that. We made peace in the Middle East temporarily, got to talk about that. But still looming above everything was this unresolved Monica Lewinsky investigation and what was going on in Iraq. And I always remember <clears throat> a very bizarre plane ride on Air Force One. We're coming back from the Middle East, having done some peace talks. And the plane is divided you know, into three sections. And in the middle section, the president's political advisors were all gathered. And we were getting near the impeachment vote. And we were very, uh, we were very aware of who we needed to be with us to avoid being impeached. And it really, as I remember, it struck me as sort of a game of political bingo. Because people were calling members of Congress from the plane, and people kept shouting out, Congressman, Ken, Congressman Quinn, we lost him. And people would all write it down, Quinn. Yes, on impeachment. And we figured out in this meeting that we were going to lose, and we didn't have the votes. Now, up in the front of the plane where the president had his office, there was a meeting going on with the national security team, going through particular war plans for launching an attack on Iraq. I was the only one going between the two meetings. And I do remember, in both meetings, sort of looking up at one point and saying, I think things are bad in here. You should see what's going on in the other meeting. <laughs> But when we landed that night at uh, Andrews Air Force Base, I, I realized three things. One is the president was going to be impeached, and soon. One was we were going to start a war with Iraq, and soon. And three, I was the one who was going to have to convince the public that one and two had nothing to do with each other. <laughs> and <clears throat> that life challenge that I'd been looking for came a lot sooner than I thought. About 10 days later, December 19th, 1998, sticks in my head a little bit, the President of the United States was facing an impeachment vote. Now, we had a, pr a pretty simple strategy for dealing with this. We said that this is all about politics, it's partisan, the President's going to stay focused on the people's business. It was simple. People believed it. Our ratings were up. Well, that day we thought was going to go as planned. Of course it didn't. About 11.30, the Speaker of the House, Bob Livingston, went to the floor, as many of you remember, and said to the effect, Larry Flint caught me. I had an affair, and the only thing honor th honorable thing to do is to resign. And he resigned on, on the floor during the impeachment debate. Now, <clears throat> we had a simple message. All of a sudden, they had one that was even simpler. Do something wrong, get caught, resign. So I figured we had about 15 minutes before everyone caught their breath to figure that out. And I knew within 15 minutes, a drumbeat on TV of pundits would start for the president should resign. So I ran down to the Oval Office. The president was there with the chief of staff, John Podesta. We were waiting for a couple of people to arrive to figure out what to do. And I said to the president, you know, not what we're going to say. What do you think? How do you feel about this? And he started talking. And I realized that what he was saying was making a lot of sense. So I started scribbling it down. I wrote it down. And I went out to the press immediately. I said, we don't need to have a meeting. This is what we're going to say. And then, as some of you may remember, the president said that it was a real, uh, <clears throat> it was a real shame that the congressman was resigning that this cycle of the politics of personal destruction had to end and should end today, and that he was going to call Livingston and say, don't resign. And oddly, the fever that I was worried about, about the president uh, having to resign or being forced to resign, broke in that very moment, which was good for me because I was late for another meeting. <laughs> I had to go to a meeting where we were working on writing the State of the Union speech. And I do remember sitting in that meeting and thinking, you know, we're sitting here discussing health care and education. This is why we're going to survive this. We're, we're actually doing the people's business. Unfortunately, someone came and tapped me on the shoulder and said, we need you out here. And I remember, it was my deputy at the time, and I remember looking at her and saying, you know, if one more thing happens today, my head's going to explode. And she said, well, then you don't want to go into your office right now. <clears throat> in my office were some of the president's national security team. They had been meeting, unbeknownst to me, downstairs talking about the military action. It had been going on now for about a week to 10 days. And I went in and they said, well, we've done this military action. Uh, we've hit everything we can. We're, gonna, we're about to go to the president to recommend he make a statement calling off the military action, claiming victory. And I looked at them and said, you got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> I said, a week ago, you had me go out and say, we found out today we're going to be impeached and we're launching a war. And today, you want me to go out and say, yeah, we got impeached. And guess what? We won the war. Um, but they said, yeah. And I said, well, isn't there anything we could hit again? 
Could we go back and hit some buildings a second time? <laughs> the military guy didn't think that was very funny. Um, but uh, I quickly acceded and said, well, we're going to have to do this. I then had what we call in the business a communications challenge. Because we had two things we had to do in the same time space, and we tried to figure out what to do. We had 150 members of Congress down to stand with the president, Democrats, and say, this impeachment was all partisan, it's all politics. And then we had to talk about the war. And I thought, you know what? Sometimes the best thing to do is not worry very much about it, just go out and do it. So out on the South Lawn, we had the Democrats, very simple message. Partisans, this is politics, Republicans suck. It all went well. You remember Al Gore called the president the greatest president in history and then ran his campaign trying to disprove that theory. <laughs> then we went, sorry. Then we went inside, only 10 minutes apart, the same podium, just a different room, a different set of flags, and said, there are no Republicans in this country, there are no Democrats, it's just Americans and we've won the war. <clears throat> and then the president left, leaving me in the room to explain to 50 waiting reporters how the two things fit together. <laughs> and I think it was so audacious that we even took the breath away from the press, and they seemed to let us get away with it. And I remember at the end of this long day, walking across the hall about 20 feet to my office, going in, and one of my closest friends in the White House was there, one of the president's top aides. And he saw me come in, <clears throat> and I sat down, and he went over to the little bar in the office and got two beers, opened them up, sat down, put his feet up, and I'll never forget what he said to me, which was, you know, except for getting impeached, we had a pretty good day. <laughs> Thank you. Joe Lockhart. <laughs>